Welcome to the week ahead. My name is Ibrahim Sani. Uh, on the show as well as my colleague uh, Hafiz Marzuki. Uh, we promised that this would be the last time we'll be uh, recording work from home, but I guess we have to extend that a little bit more. And uh, maybe we can start recording from our new set, our new studio at Bukit Jalil next week. But in the meantime, Hafiz, uh, I hope you are all well. We are going to start off with the uh, Amno General Assembly review. Um, early on Sunday, we've heard uh, the uh, president of Amno, Datuk Sri Zahid Hamidi, present a rather interesting speech, uh, a speech that is focused on the uh, closer collaboration with uh, PAS. They also, uh, the entire uh, delegation was also talking about their uneasiness uh, when it comes to the relationship with Brusatu, um, which is strange because they're already in the same uh, part in coalition, I suppose, uh, forming the government. Uh, um, and uh, little to no mention about uh, Amno's collaboration with PKR. So in the week ahead, we have to look at how the aftermath of the uh, PAO Amno 2020 is going to take shape, Abis. Yes, uh, especially with uh, Zahid. Uh, Zahid's speech, a lot of interesting things that were said uh, in his speech. Uh, among others, of course, he said he also said that he rejected uh, any attempts uh, to buy uh, the Amno support or rather the party support, uh, of course, he, he's, he has made uh, no uh, specification to which uh, party is actually offering him uh, this support uh, or, or offering to buy his support. But I think uh, the whole uh, two-day event uh, kind of goes to show what we've already expected of Amno so far. It, it is not inconsistent with what uh, the leaders have been spewing uh, since the start of 2021, which is Basically, they are very confident of going at it alone. Uh, they very much uh, covered uh, the, uh, I would say, the, the position of prime ministership. They believe they can uh, rest it back uh, if a general elections were to be held. Uh, of course, uh, there are, of course, uh, reports of uh, leaders who still are, I would uh, term as the pro Prikata national uh, leaders. Uh, but I think evidently you've, you've also seen this past weekend, Ibrahim, uh, there was a report uh, saying Tun Faiza uh, is pretty much suspended from AMNO uh, for six years. Mind you, it's not, it's not like six months or, or six weeks, it's actually six years. And, and that, is, that, that came as a surprise to me because I think you and I both know that uh, Tun Faizal is one of the staunchest uh, AMNO supporters. You could see his tweets, his Facebook prof, uh, posts. He has been a, a, a loyal Amno subject. And even then, you can see, when you start uh, saying things that is out uh, from what uh, I would say the leaders have in mind, uh, then you are deemed as to be, uh, you know, surplus to requirements. And I think, uh, I mean, of course, uh, th there are more to this, and we will see it in the coming uh, weeks, months. Especially, uh, with, I mean, everyone is keeping an eye, even uh, the leaders in AMNO have come out to say, okay, we understand that we can't do uh, general elections right now due to the pandemic, but uh, once everything uh, normalizes or stabilizes, they are raring to go, Ibrahim. And I tell you, I, I, <laughs> as, as, a, as a political observer, it would be interesting to watch. Uh, meanwhile, uh, over at the Malaysian courts uh, on Monday, we're going to start seeing the resumption of uh, a few court cases. Uh, the prosecution is expected to make its submission to seize 114 million ringgit in cash, uh, including uh, foreign currencies, not just the ringgit, um, all of the pavilion residences condominium raid. Um, if you all remember, Astro Awani was uh, at the uh, location on that night uh, when, uh, you know, tons and tons of not just cash but other stuff as well was uh, uh, seized from the pavilion residences three years ago. Uh, I'm, no, uh, former, I'm no former president and I'm no former prime minister, uh, Dato Sri Najib Razak, claimed that the 114 million ringgit belonged to the political party, belonged to Amno. So there's going to be a conversation there as well. Meanwhile, on Thursday, one Malaysia development uh, Berhad linked asset forfeiture case involving uh, Rosmar Manso. 
um, and their children, uh, Nuryana Najwa, Nur Ashman Raza, as well as Najib's stepson, uh, Riza Shahriz Abdul Aziz, or Riza Aziz, will continue. Uh, and uh, this is uh, just one of the many uh, court cases that is taking place uh, regarding the AMNO members, uh, and in this case, for next week, it's going to be Najib. But uh, Datuk Sri Zaid Amidi, the current or the sitting president of AMNO, court cases is still up, uh, ongoing, and that is going to be mentioned uh, in the uh, weeks to come. Yes, chiming, chiming in here, Ibrahim, uh, we all know that since the start of the year, actually, uh, we've been keeping a close eye, uh, not just us actually, Astro Awani as a whole have been keeping a close eye on the court cases uh, surrounding uh, former prime ministers, uh, former ministers. Uh, and, and I think what's interesting to add on is, of course, uh, of course, there are many court cases involving uh, Dr. Sri Najib, but I think recently he has come out to say that uh, Amno can actually stop uh, defending him. Uh, he will deal with the court cases himself, and he insisted that he will continue to defend Amno. Uh, he will continue to defend himself. I think this is part of the whole uh, a boss coup persona that he's, he's building. And I think it's interesting to see in the coming uh, weeks and months how uh, all of these uh, court cases will pan out. Because as you know, um, I mean, there's only one decision uh, that's been made so far. And of course, Dato Sri Najib has already appealed uh, on that front. And I think uh, it, it will also be interesting to see uh, what were to happen to uh, his wife's uh, that is Sri Rosmah Mansur's court cases as well. Uh, yeah. All in all, we just hope that it's going to be, uh, I mean, the rule of law will be, um, will be uh, I mean, uh, be, be given, given due respect. And we'll see, uh, hopefully, a good end or a, a, a good uh, conclusion uh, to this uh, barrage of court cases, Ibrahim. The uh, element of elections has also uh, or must be also be talked about because uh, tying into what we discussed earlier is um, the uh, statement that was coming in out of the uh, president of AMNO, Zaid Amidi, during the AMNO General Assembly was that AMNO is going to contest alone using the BN flag as per they've always done since, I don't know, 1970s. Um, and uh, there will be a direct correlation into how AMNO will perform versus a sort of uh, referendum against the popularity and the trustworthiness of their own leaders. Uh, and it is also important for us to uh, take heed that sometimes, according to voters' preferences, they might not necessarily be entirely too concerned about court cases pertaining to some political members. And while this may be something uh, abhorred by urban voters, rural voters might not be so sensitive about it. So, you know, Malaysia is a big country, it's a diverse country with a lot of voter preferences, voter demographies and all that. So I suppose it's not going to be um, too perplexing for us to explain if AMNO returns to popularity in the upcoming elections. But that's uh, one element. And finally, before we go into the break, I want to talk a little bit more uh, about uh, the Rose Mahmanso case per se. Um, we've heard uh, some cases when it comes to uh, the uh, judge being removed. Uh, we've spoken to the, uh, we've spoken about this issue on the week ahead with you, Hafiz. Yes. Uh, but it's not just about some of the judges being removed or taken in or all that. It's also the independence or the independence of the judiciary per se. Uh, I think as much as this is a trial on uh, Najib and Rosma and the likes and, and 1MDB, it is also testing our judiciary process. What do you think of this? Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the freedom of judiciary has come into question or rather has come into the spotlight. Uh, this year, actually, you've, you've seen with all the cases, and uh, I think it is important to look at how the judiciary responds. Uh, it, it has been somewhat uh, um, concerning that, that, that people are saying that people are interfering in the judiciary. But it appears to me, uh, at least, that the, the, ju the judiciary seems to be making the decisions as per each case. That means they look into each and every case. Uh, they judge accordingly. They've seen uh, the facts of the case and what was bring forward. And then they decide, and 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 this is good uh, to see in the uh, I would say in the long run because it is important to have 
uh, an independent uh, judiciary, uh, we will continue to look on uh, on on not just uh, previous, uh, not just upcoming cases, but uh, but also uh, the uh, moving forward in terms of uh, what kind of cases get put up in the court. Uh, and uh, of course, we at Astro Awani always keep a close eye on these things, and uh, we'll see uh, what what happens in the coming months. All right. So Monday, um, 29th uh, is Najib's case, and Thursday. Uh, 1st of April is going to be Rosma's case, so keep an eye out on that. For now, we'll go for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about the Bank Negara 2020 annual report. Welcome back. This is The Week Ahead. I have with me Hafiz Marzuki, halfway across Kuala Lumpur. I am in Kota Namansara. We're both broadcasting from home, hopefully for the last time. Uh, yeah. And uh, before we move into our new studios uh, in Bukit Jalil, uh, we want to talk a little bit more about Bank Negara's 2020 annual report. As you all might have been aware, um, all the regulatory bodies and statutory bodies and uh, most companies, nearly all companies, have published already their 2020 reports. So Bank Negara will be one of the last few institutions to publish their 2020 annual reports. That's happening on Wednesday or Thursday. They are expected to give their assessment into how the 2020 uh, year looked like, but more importantly, that they will also present uh, forecasting outlook into their version of what 2021 will bring about. So that is uh, a key indicator of how Bank Negara sees the country performing. We've seen that uh, actual GDP growth or shrinkage is actually closer than expected to Bank Negara's guesstimates. Uh, so therefore, there's a lot of economists and uh, economic pundits uh, are going to keep a close eye on Bank Negara's 2021 statements uh, that is going to be published uh, this Wednesday. Bank Negara will also be releasing the Economic and Monetary Review of 2020 and the Financial Stability Review for the second half of 2020. And uh, those reports are going to tell a greater color into how bad, or actually, I don't know how good Malaysia has recovered, whether it's a V-shaped uh, recovery for the second half of 2020. Yes. Ibrahim, uh, I, I just want to chime in here and, and, and just ask you a question. I think uh, looking back at, at 2020, I think, uh, of course, it is only natural that uh, Malaysia ha uh, suffers a GDP shrink shrinkage, and it is, uh, it is, uh, I would say, it is logical for any country to actually experience a negative GDP growth. And of course, uh, looking to twenty twenty one, of course, the projected growth is is bigger uh, than expected. But maybe you could you could help me and also our viewers. Uh, how how do we uh, how do we look at this? Because uh, I've been hearing uh, some people are asking questions that oh. Uh, Malaysia is going to have uh, one of the strongest uh, economy because we're going to bounce back 7%. But but how how does it relate to actual uh, GDP gains uh, for Malaysia? Well, we, look, we have to look at the source, right? The 7% was mentioned by MOF. So MOF was way off in their 2020 GDP uh, forecast. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, economists are saying that uh, because of the trend, that the MOF has been a little bit off in terms of their economic forecast, not just for last year, but in previous years, the closer ones would most probably be a consensus view of, say, the World Bank, the IMF, um, Bank Negara, and you take an average of all these few uh, institutions and you get a good picture. But it doesn't matter, forecast is still forecast. What you need to really look at is on the headline inflation rate, which has also bounced back uh, quite interestingly. We've seen a deflation of the past few months uh, towards the end of last year and earlier this year, but now headline inflation is already on the back uh, or rising. Uh, we have to look at private investments and, of, of course, uh, foreign investments uh, as a subcluster of private investments. We look at private consumption, people like you and me buying more stuff, Hafiz, or buying less stuff. Uh, and whether or not we are getting more for our buck, which is uh, the uh, basket of goods uh, price, uh, CPI index, whether or not it's rising or uh, uh, decreasing. Another element that we got to look at is the housing market, whether or not it's, uh, uh, we're seeing a lot more vacancy, 
for the housing market. But I don't think the housing market is a focus uh, in the recent months. It's actually the office space market that is uh, facing a dearth. In fact, you know, think about it. We are leaving or departing Bursa Malaysia. That's going to be an empty spot. And I don't know how long Bursa is going to keep that empty um, or how long they need the time to fill it up to re uh, replace us as one of the bigger tenants there. So those are the things that they got to think about because all this comes down to then employment. As we all know, it's 800,000 people unemployed. Unemployment rate is at 4.9%. And this is one of the highest since the uh, uh, Asian financial crisis of 1997. Um, we are looking at external debt position. Uh, I remember just two weeks ago, there was a kerfuffle between whether or not we have breached that 60% debt limit or you know we are at 65%. Is it statutory debt? Is it total debt? Basically debt, lah. and that is a big problem. So there's so many intricacies element to this. What I want to uh, encourage my colleagues out there in the media space is to not cherry pick the kind of data, uh, economic data that is coming out. Because once you cherry pick, you're not going to give a good full picture. And when that happens, you're going to be labeled as sensationalist. Even if the things that you do cherry pick kind of make sense, Say, for instance, if you want to focus so on, on headline inflation, for instance. But if you don't tie that with private consumption, you don't tie that with CPI, with unemployment, with the market, housing market, with property market, you're not telling a good picture. That's why it's in order for us to tell a better picture for the public to uh, consume. When uh, the financial report comes out, uh, Benegara 2020 financial report comes out, it should be discussed as best as possible in its entirety to give the clearest picture possible. Otherwise, you're just going to give a snapshot of little bits and bobs here and there without giving a clear, true picture of how the economy has been and how the economy is forecasted to be for this year. Excellent, Ibrahim. Actually, yeah, definitely. Uh, cherry picking is one thing, but it's just uh, reporting only uh, one part of the story didn't give, uh, would not give uh, readers, uh, the mass public, an accurate picture of uh, what we are facing. And hopefully, uh, of course, as we we face uh, this very, uh, I would say, uh, tough and challenging year, uh, actually starting from last year uh, until all the way until this year, we hope uh, we can see a, a good recovery. And of course, uh, recently, uh, I mean, we are at the end of the first quarter. Uh, it will be exciting to see uh, what kind of uh, financial results uh, would show uh, in this first quarter. But of course, that report will come out uh, much later and we will keep an eye on it. Ibrahim. Speaking about uh, quarterly reports and yearly reports, uh, on the corporate front, there's a lot of uh, EGMs and AGMs happening. But before we start to list the companies doing their AGMs and EGMs and all that, I just want to ask your opinion, Hafiz. What do you think of uh, last week's uh, Berjaya Corporation appointment of Jalil Rashid? Wow, I think I think it's quite an, a hot topic uh, among, uh, I, I wouldn't say not just uh, the business community, but uh, the general community as well. As we know, we all know Jalil Rashid is a household name, uh, especially since he took over the uh, PNB CEO uh, after uh, Pakatan Harapan uh, took over administration uh, in 2018. Uh, I find it interesting because, uh, I mean, this, he is the first uh, non-family uh, to be appointed in, in, uh, into the CEO's position. And what's more interesting, actually, Ibrahim, is that I think, I believe, a few days later after he was uh, announced, as uh, the group, the new group CEO, he actually invested uh, a good. I, I think he bought seventy million shares at twenty eight cents per share uh, to to acquire a one point. I mean, I mean a one point four or one point eight percent stake in the company. Uh, it's very interesting to see how this dynamics played out. But um, I, I guess we have to that see because you think about it, it's very big. It, it cost. Uh, 20 million or 19 point something ringgit million uh, and and you don't spend your entire wealth on buying just one single stock so my question is what is the net worth of Jalil Rashid is he truly um, you know in the tens of millions and remember he is still uh, legally classified as a millennial <laughs> because he was uh, born in the early 80s uh, and uh, it's also a true a triumphant story of how a person, if they work hard, they can actually excel. Uh, he took down a hater on Twitter. Basically, the person was talking about, uh, you know, oh, it's easy because it's related to so-and-so and, and, and son-in-law of this and nephew of that. And of course, none of that is like, you know, accurate. Uh, he's, I don't know why those kind of rumors continue to swirl, but 
it's a matter of through grit and um, through uh, hard work uh, that he has gotten those kind of uh, you know professional excellence. But what does it mean for individuals uh, working and having their skin in the game? Uh, Nasir Talib, a person that is a corporate thinker, uh, was talking about uh, skin in the game and perhaps uh, managers or business owners that have their skin in the game would tend to fare better. Uh, and this was highlighted to us by our colleague, um, Lisa Idris. And I haven't read the book at all yet, but uh, oh. that is something that I want to keep on my uh, must read kind of list. Okay, on the corporate front, Bursa Malaysia listed companies are expected to hold AGM or annual general meetings in the week to come. They include Bursa Malaysia Berhad themselves, uh, Eco World and Eco World International, Eco World Development. We're talking about Capital and Malaysia Mall Trust and LPI Capital Berhad. These companies are having a mixed bag of um, fortunes. Bursa Malaysia Berhad have seen uh, their fortunes rise. Uh, because of the active involvement of retail investors last year and uh, the average retail trade jumped a certain number of percent. I don't remember off the cuff, but it was a huge jump year on year compared to 2019 versus 2020. And then uh, on the Eco World, Capital Land, uh, Mall Trust, and LPI Capital, there's a different story altogether. It's about companies that are in the property sector. And as we have spoken just now, the property sector is way in trouble. So yeah, different results there as well. Uh, EGM, so extraordinary meeting, to sort out some board changes and also private placements include all the other companies. But uh, some companies you can think about is BIMB Holdings Berhad, Dagang Exchange and Menang Corporation Berhad. So those are the kind of conversations that we are expecting to observe uh, in the coming week to come. Of course, uh, and, and of course, Ibrahim, uh, as usual, uh, in the week ahead, we always uh, keep an eye on this. But I do want to bring this back, actually, to last week, uh, where we, we were actually talking about uh, Astro uh, announcing their, their financial report. And I think, I believe, based on what I'm reading, uh, it, it's, it is a decent uh, performance uh, by our company, of course. But uh, what, what do you make of it? You know, it's it's tough to not uh, uh, say uh, something without feeling the need to feel biased. So I'm just going to let other people say it. This is uh, this is some of the uh, analyst reports, right? Uh, CGSIMB has an ad uh, to the Astro counter. They say that uh, Astro's uh, 2021, which is last year's core profit, was 3% higher than CGS's forecast. TV fed better uh, than CGS CIMB's uh, expectation. And they say that uh, because uh, home shopping revenue jumped 25% year on year, uh, they are raising, i.e. CGS CIMB is raising the earnings per share of Astro by 17 to 32% on higher subscription turnover and lower operating cost. By the way, CGS CIMB expects uh, or calculated the WAC or the weighted average cost of capital for Astro to be around 10%. Uh, so that is something that we need to think about for cost of capital for Astro. Uh, City uh, has an action call or a buy call on Astro. They say that our Patami is ahead of street estimates and dividend surprise. Oh, that's true. Uh, dividend is now 8.5% uh, uh, cent. Uh, the, uh, uh, the biggest surprise that was announced by the chairman, Tunzaki, says that Astro is declaring a 1.5 cent regular and 2.5 cent special dividend, taking full year DPS or dividend per share to 8 cent or 9% dividend yield. And according to Citi, this come, came sharply ahead of street expectations of 6.5% and Citi's own expectation of 7.0%. So that's Citi. Kenanga has uh, an outperform uh, call on Astro Macquarie has a uh, buy on Astro and uh, Maybank uh, KE or Maybank Kim Eng um, was also on a buy, but that this is a maintained buy with a higher target price of around one ringgit 33 cent. So yeah, as you can see, consensus is there. Astro, because of the diversification of home shopping um, over the top uh, uh, business, um, and of course the mainstay power, which is Astro Awani, continues to drive the brand uh, forward. So it's not going to be an easy year for anybody, including Astro, but it seems like Astro uh, has uh, done fairly better than most for last year and will continue to do better than most for this year. 
Yes, that's uh, that's fairly uh, great to hear, uh, and and it's it's just impressive to hear all uh, all these details that you have uh, uh, spewed out, uh, forecasting or rather uh, giving their take on how uh, Astro performs, Ibrahim. Okay, so that's it for this week's uh, episode of the week ahead. Uh, I'm going to make the same promise I made last week. This will be the last episode that we're going to be recording work from home because I can't wait to jump in. Can you believe it? We're now saying that we can't wait to get to work at our offices. But uh, yeah, that's exactly my feeling right now. I don't know about you, Hafiz. Are you excited about the new studio? Of course, of course. Uh, actually, it's, it's, it's tomorrow, right? Uh, it's tomorrow. It's, we're, we're, we're uh, I would say, reporting for duty uh, at the new office tomorrow. Everything, uh, all the system is good to go. And uh, hopefully, we'll, you we get to be uh, we get to see each other actually in the uh, in the new studio as we yeah. record uh, the next week's uh, week ahead right of course and we're going to do a lot of rehearsals to make sure that everything's going to go smoothly but in the meantime stay tuned to astro awani if you've missed any part of this show just head on to astron.com and find out more shows like this until then thanks very much that was Safis marzuki online with me i am ibrahim sani until we meet again in the week ahead <laughs>